Please join me in welcoming our two Deloitte Argentina speakers, Valentina Palacin and Ruth Barbasil. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Katie, for the introduction. Uh, well, as Katie said, we are Ruth and Valentina, and we are the writers of the MITRE framework, and we are going to show you how to build your own Fed library. First, we are going to go into what is exactly a Fed, Fed library. Then we are going to cover how to build one, to speak a little about uh, the problems that we encounter. And to finally, we are going to end with some lessons we learned that you can take with you. But first, I'm going to talk a little bit about our backgrounds. So Ruth is the Fed Library team project leader. She started with the project around almost four years ago. Uh, she is an information security specialist and information system engineer. And myself, I have a background in translation. So I contributed the project uh, for two year, almost two years now. Uh, with the helping with the editorial process, and I'm also using my programming skills to help with automation and da data analysis. But first, let's introduce you a little bit about what, uh, why we uh, came out with this project. Um, when I first started in cyber threat intelligence, one of my first tasks was to collect indicators of compromise from public sources. Uh, this was a really exhausting job. Uh, it was really uh, messy. But we learned a lot about uh, in the way, and now it's uh, uh, luckily everything is uh, scripting, so now we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> but we learn a lot in this process. So one of the things that we have to do in those uh, Excel spreadsheets that we use for uh, indicator collection uh, was to describe the malware that we were uh, collecting the indicators from. So uh, what is interesting about this is that the description often uh, mixes where, where the malware, the threat actors, and the campaigns. Uh, and pivoting through this data was really difficult. If I wanted to know what other uh, malware pieces were using a threat actor, it was really difficult for me to do that. So one day, uh, we were with Sheplag and we were talking with the director of the threat intelligence team, which is John Martin. Um, and he uh, and me, we were t thinking about how we can improve the information that we were already collecting, but showing in an interesting way that you can uh, query in, in an easy way. So this is how this uh, library is started. But what it seems to be like the solution to all of our desires and needs uh, may not end up destroying us if we don't do it well. <laughs> so let's start a little bit managing the expectation of a process uh, of this kind. So it's not a solution by itself. The project is, is uh, meant to be for analysts so they can dig into data uh, regarding the threat actors in, a, in an easy way, but they are the, the main th the thinkers about what it, the output is going to be. Also, this is not a collection of all existing attacks. There is too many information. There is too many things happening out there. So we focus only on highly targeted attacks, uh, focusing on industries on which Deloitte has clients on. This is also not an indicator feed. You may find some indicators but it's not meant to be as a fit for a SOC or something like that. It's only to check the information and validate the information that we are already putting in the page and also extracting some useful things that can be helpful for threat hunting. Uh, it's also not perfect. People that is writing the reports that we are consuming is people, we are people, so we are prone to errors and we are not perfect. Uh, so we, can, we have to put a workflow which includes the, the quality assurance to be able to put the, the most uh, information that we can in the most meaningful way. And it's also not fixed in time because think how this is the way as Frankenstein monster information, it's a lie. Uh, so what to do expect uh, of a project of this kind uh, is to have a normalized and catalog information uh, so you can uh, find the information that you are trying to uh, spot in a, a particular specific place of the report. Also, you can see this as an activity journal. We have uh, key observables for each one of these threads. Uh, we gather a lot of operations uh, of the APT, so this is a way that we can see the evolution of them. And also, the idea is to have all in one place, so you don't have to query and go through uh, multiple sources and dig through a lot of information because we already done that for you. 
So when we started with this, we, ha we are seeing this huge monster, which is, a, is a composed of volatile sources, private feed, OSIN sources, naming conventions, and a lo lot of things that overwhelm us, and we feel really tiny ag against this huge monster. Some of the issues that we came across, uh, we are st still struggling with, and we are not going to, to get rid of them sooner. <laughs> But uh, we have observed a lot of diverse formatting uh, and distribution of the information, even for one uh, organization. They have different uh, formatting uh, between uh, one report and another, so you don't find the information always in the same place. Also, we observe a lot of uh, overlapping and attributions that we can't really validate because we have a lack of context or indicators and evidence of what they are reporting on, and that is really difficult for us to, to put uh, uh, confidence level on that. But this makes us feel really like we are going to be crushed by stress and fatigue, but don't worry, we are not going to die. So, moving uh, forward with this uh, Indiana Jones analogy, uh, we sometimes think like being a threat intelligent analyst is a little bit of like going through a jungle of information, open our way with a blade and finding ancient data, trying to dig and find the treasure in it. Uh, so what to do to not get swamped and buried with all that, uh, that huge ancient information? So what we do is to follow uh, a structure pretty similar to the one MITRE used on the web page. Um, we distinguish the events and we kind of organize them in ter uh, against what are the industry they hit, uh, mostly based on the Lloyd's industries of interest. Uh, we also relate them with the threat actors and with the tools, and we use the attack framework to identify the, tool, the tools, tactics, techniques, and procedures. Um, well, let's talk a little bit what you will find when you get into the threat library. So the first thing we do is to um, offer all the campaigns around the day they happened, or if we don't have that information at the, around the day they were released. We also try to follow the same structure for all the titles. We, try, we would like to be able to see at a glance the APT involved, what was the target, could be the industry, the country, or even an entity, and with what. And we find that this structure is pretty useful when you are doing analysis and also when you are trying to prioritize or are you reviewing process. Uh, then when you get into one incident, this is like the scorecard. So you can see the campaign period, the release date, the confidence level, also which region, country, and industries were affected, and a, a little summary about the incident. And then, if we are lucky enough, and there's some information about the victims, like in the other this other case, well, you will see that too. And we follow sticks terminology to classify the campaigns according to the intended effects behind them. And finally, we provide a brief description of the associated actor and a link to the threat actor page. Then, all this scorecard is followed by what we call the main information. And the main information is a structure in three sections. The first one is the initial access section in which we try to publish everything related to how the threat actor gained foothold into the victim system. Uh, we provide a screenshot and also the files that were used, information about the files that were used, and a list of all the tools involved with a description and a link to the tool page. Also, after that, we provide a technical description about the campaign. Finally, the page closes with what we call the analysis, attribution, and geolocation information. So, for example, we put there, if we have something that could be meaningful to know where the threat actor is located, or if there are similarities with other campaigns or other uh, groups. And in the last section, which is the analysis, we gather all the information related to why the attribution was made or it wasn't made, and also, when we can, we also provide our own assessments about the incident. In the case of the tools, we call it tools because it's not only malware, they are also legitimate tools being abused for this uh, kind of stuff. 
but we uh, are following some, uh, some patterns similar to the attack software pages, but we added a couple of uh, additional things. Uh, we added a description and a details, and in the details we put uh, specific technical stuff that they are using in that specific uh, campaign, and we put a column of campaign uh, on which that malware was seen and was reported. So we do this because we think that this is the best way to spot when a procedure is changing, uh, when a procedure is, is changing the way that the technique is being applied so you can uh, further understand how the threat actor is evolving. Uh, we are also adding information regarding the indicators that we've seen in those campaigns, uh, mainly uh, network and file related. But this, again, is not an indicator feed. This is only to validate the information that we are already putting there and to uh, also uh, further extract characteristics that may be helpful in threat hunting and threat reporting. Uh, for threat actors, talking about having all in one site, in one page, I think that this is the most clear uh, way to see it. Uh, the threat actors has an uh, interesting scorecard in which we put all the things that we think that are really important to spot at first, which are the affected regions, countries, and industries. But we also try to uh, understand what are the threat actor types, if they are, are state sponsor, if they are a cybercrime actor, also the sophistication level of these threat actors, and the motivations behind it. And to do this, we follow, again, the six vocabulary because we want to use the same language uh, across uh, all the industries. And if you see in the right part of the screen, you're going to see the content table. Uh, one of the things at the bottom are the tool set and campaigns, which are just a summary of the tools and campaigns that we are already mentioned. Uh, but you can see uh, everything that is related to this actor and pivot through the data. And we have also a part of relevant information. This is done because sometimes we find information that it can't be fit in any of these sectors that we already mentioned, or we can't link them with a specific campaign, but we think that it's really important information to have. For example, you can see there it, we have the zero day vulnerabilities used by APT28. And there it says point of entry. Why? Okay, so when we started this project, we thought that understanding the initial foothold on the threat actors uh, that did in the organization was really important to our clients, but the tactic initial access didn't exist at the time, so we came up with this point of entry tactic. And then when uh, attack added to it, uh, we deprecate that one and st stick with the framework. So now that we talk about what and the how, let's talk a little bit about the problems we encounter. So for sure, the most difficult to identify are the full flag campaigns. The analysis bias, we have to remember that we work mostly with Western so sources. Uh, we'll try to do otherwise sometimes, but it's difficult and time consuming. And also we have to carry it with our own bias too. And also the misattribution, because as Ruth mentioned, sometimes a report didn't have information about what, uh, why an attribution was made, or they don't have indicative compromise that we can download to carry out our own, our own analysis. But uh, remembering that we are all humans, there are other things that sometimes we spot, and we have some examples to show you. Um, these are some that hit us in some way or another, so we, we identify and we are going to share with you. For example, in this case, we find that uh, allegedly there was a threat actor targeting Argentina. So we were fairly curious, because it's our er area of work, so we went there, and it turned out that actually what happened was that indicators were uploaded for, um, by our research team. So it's, it's important to remember that not all the time where, where a file is uploaded is that it means that the attack is happening there. Uh, but I'm sure the, this redactor is going to hit us sooner than, rather than later. Uh, another thing we find uh, problematic, and this is especially a tricky one, because we cannot know it all and none, none the, the, the people that's publishing the report, neither us. Uh, so sometimes we find things, uh, if you can move me the other slide, pick. thank you. Like this, in this case, which is referring a phishing campaign that happened uh, a long time ago. So uh, some beautiful soul found an Spanish expression, which is actually an, uh, um, a swearing, uh, which uh, is pronounced la concha de tu madre. Uh, <laughs> uh, so now we, we, you can swear like an Argentinian. 
Uh, but this beautiful soul translated as the shell of your mother, which is adorable, but it's, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not exactly that. It's a clean set meaning will be something like your mother private parts. And why? Why we are talking about this? Why we are showing you this? Well, if we go to this map, there are 20 countries in which Spanish is spoken officially. And I, I'm stressing officially because there are more countries in which Spanish is spoken. But from those 20, that expression is used only in seven countries. And we know this observable is now enough on itself to assure that the threat actor comes to, from these places. But maybe we have another indicator, indicator that we can add up to, to say, well, it's from here. And especially considering that we have a fairly, threat actor, fairly active threat actor on the region. And finally, we, le we left the biggest headache for last, which is the overlapping attributions. That is the way we call the multiple naming for the same threat actors. So the way we dealt with this is to create something similar to the attack matrix for tactics and techniques, but with vendors and aliases. I'm sure you all really want to see it, but I'm not going to show you that. <laughs> it takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of research and really complex and refined work. So we have to especially mention one of our team members, Francis now that couldn't be here with us, but we need he, credit is due. Uh, he's helping in dialogue with it. And what also do is to, is to rate the sources. So we find a way to rate the sources consider, considering its type. Also, the, using the matrix, we rate the vendors according to the visibility by region based on public reports. Remember, we are always talking about public reports. Also, we rate independent researchers by their reputation. And also, we judge if the, if the source has ASCs available to carry out our own analysis. But even though having a formula is awesome, and we encourage everyone here to come up with your own formula to do this, it is important to remember that you need to be able to overrule it as you see fit when necessary. Now let's keep on moving. And I, I want to, to, to teach you how to read the book of secrets. So let's keep in mind that when you're reading a source, you have to identify if they are reporting about a threat actor, a campaign, or a malware piece, or maybe a combination of those. In this case, we're going to focus only on what are malware reports, uh, because we are going to extract the TTPs from those. Uh, first, I want to, you to read the source and identify the paragraph uh, describing the behavior. I think if someone was, uh, yesterday, uh, they did a CTI, uh, CTI training here that was great and they explained this in a pretty neat way. Uh, but you have to, it's basically the same, the same uh, process. You have to read the source, identify, identify the paragraph that are describing the behaviors, and then you can move and identify the tactic. I uh, think just one second, uh, we have already, uh, attack has uh, 266 only enterprise techniques and only 12 tactics. So clearly identifying the tactic is going to be much easier than spotting the technique. Once we have the tactic that it belongs to, we can go through the attack navigator, for example, and look for all the techniques that fit in under that specific tactic and uh, being able to spot what are the description and the technique that belongs to that description. But you can maybe don't find what you are searching for, and in that case, you should create your own. So let's move to a couple of, um, of examples of this. This is a, a piece of malware that the threat actor is not really using a lot of evasion, but they are using a valid certificate to sign on this malware piece. So this is clearly a defense evasion technique. And under the defense evasion, we can find a lot of techniques, but there is a specific technique that suits the specific um, description of this, which is the uh, code signing technique, okay? So we can see it's saying the same, the signing certificate to masquerade the malware and make it appear like as legitimate. So it's clearly this technique that we are trying to spot. We have another example which is a, a little bit more trickier. Um, 
In this case, this is a locker GOGA extract of the raw report. Um, and the, in this case, the threat actors behind this malware are changing the default uh, the credentials of the administrator accounts. So the users can't access to their system. They can't work. And of course, they can even read the ransom note and having the chance to pay, which we don't recommend at all. <laughs> but this is clearly an impact tactic. And at the time that we were writing this, uh, this presentation, uh, we couldn't find any techniques that suits under this specific uh, description. So we came up with our own. Uh, in this case, we are going to use the naming convention of uh, attackcon001, which is uh, our first technique created. Uh, you should do the same, you should stick with one specific format so you don't get lost. And also we put a clear description of the name so you can understand more or less what we are trying to, to say with that technique. Uh, but a week ago, uh, Attack added this technique <laughs> with another name, so now we can deprecate this one and we can stick with the taxonomy that they are using and stick with the framework and, and move on. Now that we talk about the what and the how and the problems, let's uh, summarize everything with some lessons we learned that you could benefit from. First, choose a good technology to build on. Think that information, again, information is alive. <laughs> the framework is con constantly evolutioning and it's changing and it has to be that way. So the platform you're going to use must support this kind of evolution and this kind of changes. Also, do not misunderstand the objectives. Again, there is a lot of information, a lot of attacks going on, so you have to understand that you don't have unlimited resources. You have to focus on something. Uh, so it's not about collecting everything. Uh, again, in our case, we are uh, specifically trying to uh, cover what are highly targeted attacks against the industries on which we have clients on. Um, really important is to define good quality workloads. So think about this. Um, Poor display content, uh, poor presented content is the same as not content presented at all. So what we do is we have a, a simplified version of the editorial process. So first someone goes to production and creates the, the, the report. Uh, for example, extracts the tactics and the technique. Then someone else review it. And maybe it could add something. Uh, some, maybe the, the producer forgot a technique or missed uh, something. Uh, the formatting is not right, and then we will be sent back to production until, un until it's, it's sufficiently good enough to go to the proofreader, which will be the final set of eyes that will review uh, the, all the content before it gets approved and it will be accessible to the client. So sticking with uh, good presented content, it's important that you should all be choosing a taxonomy and a sticking with it. Uh, in our case, uh, for example, if you want, we call threat actors, but MITRE uses adversaries. And you may want to call cyber actors or enemies. It's your, actually, it's, it's your choice. But the important thing is that you are not changing between terms in a WIMP. So in our case, we chose a sticks for vocabulary and we structure all our content around the attack framework. Also, it's important to think how the information is going to be consumed. Uh, we learned this the hard way. <laughs> so when we started, our first reports were really messy and complicated to go through. Uh, but then when Valentina joined, uh, she really helped us to put a template and a structure for the information. So now all the reports are really easy to understand and are really easy to spot the important information that you are after. Uh, and also think about how all the information and the intelligence that you're collecting can be transformed into more information. So you probably may want to know which are the most active threat actors in a specific region, maybe the most targeted industries, or maybe uh, what are the most used techniques for a specific country. Uh, or, or maybe you want to only know what were the most used techniques in a period of time. So having that in mind uh, will uh, allow you to understand better how to structure the data. Uh, and also, about just uh, like a summer of everything, you have to think where that is really, really, really important to be consistent. So that's kind of all from our part. Uh, before finishing, we want to thank all the Threat Library team members that couldn't be here with us, but it wouldn't be, the project wouldn't be possible without their help. We also want to thank the attack team 
Katie, De uh, Adam, Blake, uh, Debbie, and all the people behind my tag for all the support and collaboration. And well, thank you all for listening to our presentation. And if you have any questions, you can ask or you can hit us with our social media.